very casually and luxuriously, luxuriously drove it to Miami. Along the southern border during the winter, didn't see a flake of snow. And it was so interesting. It really was. We stopped at every Chabad house along the way. Places that nobody visits. Like Oklahoma City. Uh, Austin, Texas. Campus there. It was It was really nice. So that's one suggestion. And if you already did the southern border, try doing the northern border, the northern states. Not in the winter, but it's really beautiful. After that, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> After that, we didn't come up with any great ideas. But of course, visiting the grandchildren, that keeps you busy for a while. Sometimes having an empty nest, you can be busier than you were when you had your children at home. But let's get to the issue it itself. Every stage in life has its main feature its main purpose. The empty nest is a stage of life. It's the way God created the world. Your children do grow up and they do move on. And you want them to. Sometimes you're desperate for them to move on. And you're very proud of them when they move on and they establish themselves and make a life for themselves and so on. So what is the nature of those years when the family is grown and you're alone in the house with each other? Well, number one, there is a, there is a way to serve God with whatever it is he gives you. I'm sure you've heard me say this before. We have more than we need. Everyone does. Question is only, what do you have more than you need? Some people have more money than they need. That's nice. Some people have more pain than they need. Some people have more energy, more information and knowledge. All of those are meant to be shared with God. Whatever God gives you in abundance, you give at least a tenth back to him. One of the things you could have more than you need is time. You find yourself all of a sudden with a lot of free time. Is that terrible? Is that a loss of meaning and purpose? No, that is the purpose. God is giving you a lot of time. How can you share that with him? Give him at least a tenth of your time, of the day. That could be very meaningful. And in traditional Jewish life, those years were years of real growth, personal growth in the relationship with God. First of all, you have the time. Second of all, you have the right. 
you feel justified. I did my thing. I've raised a family. My children are grown. I deserve. Not, not in an arrogant sense, but if I'm if I'm feeling okay about that stage of life, that I can also feel okay about the new stage of life. The sad part or the painful part is the children are now grown and we have all sorts of regrets. We didn't take advantage of the time that we had them at home when we could have raised them, trained them, inspired them, taught them, comforted them, or whatever it is that we regret. And there are lots of regrets. I don't think there's a sane, intelligent parent who doesn't have a lot of regrets. What could have been, what I could have done, what I should have done. So first of all, let's get that out of the way. Living with regrets is not a healthy way to go. And we've also spoken about this many times. There are two kinds of regrets. There is the regret of what could have been. There was an opportunity. If I had taken advantage of that opportunity, I would have benefited greatly. I didn't take advantage of that opportunity, and so I missed that benefit. I could have invested in a very lucrative stock, and I didn't. And had I invested in that stock, I would now be rich. So I regret not having taken advantage of that opportunity. I'm regretting what could have been. I could now be rich. You can do the same thing with children. I regret not taking them on more trips. I regret not getting them to read more books. I regret not spending more time. I regret all of these things. What would have been? How would things be different if I had done all of those things that I could have done? Maybe my children would be more successful. Maybe they would be more wealthy. Maybe they would be more knowledgeable. Maybe. That's one kind of regret. The regret of what could have been. Then there's the regret of what should have been. Very different. Let's look at the difference. Number one. When you regret what could have been, you're only guessing. Had I invested in that stock, I would now be rich. Maybe. There's no guarantee. Had I bought up some real estate when I was young, I would now have a lot of money to retire. Not necessarily. You could have lost all that money in your investment in real estate. So maybe, had you done something differently, maybe the results would have been different and better. But then again, maybe they wouldn't be any different, or maybe they would be worse. So the regret is not completely justified. Even, even with health issues. Had I noticed and paid attention, had I gone to a doctor earlier, had I had the operation, I would now be in better shape. You don't know that. Maybe. There's no guarantee. On the other hand, if you're regretting what should have been, the regret is valid. It should have been, and you didn't do it. You should have honored your parents, and you didn't. 
Those are moral obligations. So if you didn't do it, you are right to regret it because you really should have done it. Because had you done it, it would have been the right thing. Not maybe, definitely. The other difference is this. If I regret not having invested in a certain stock, and I regret it very sincerely, will I acquire that stock? I mean, I really regret. I mean it. I mean it. I'm, I'm regretting it very deeply. I really, really wish I had bought that stock. Now, so does the stock become mine a little bit? I mean, I've, I'm, I'm crying. I'm regretting. Does it become mine a little bit? No, it doesn't. But if I regret what should have been, I should have been more sensitive and more thoughtful in the way I treated my parents. Does that make a difference? Yes. Your relationship with your parents has just changed for the better. You may not have the opportunity to honor them the way you could have back then, but the very fact that you regret not honoring them brings you closer to them. More sensitive, more thoughtful, more considerate, even if they've already passed away. If you regret not doing a mitzvah, the regret itself brings you closer to God. He asked you to do something. You didn't do it. Now you wish you had done it. Because he asked. Okay, so now you've become more sensitive, more thoughtful, more connected to God because when you didn't do it, you were thoughtless. You weren't aware of God. You weren't concerned with God. Now you're concerned. It's already better. Some poor man begged you for some food or for some money and you refused him. And then you found out that he died from hunger. You regret? Does that make a difference? Is it going to bring him back? No. But it'll make you a more charitable person. If you really regret not having given charity, you become more charitable. So regretting what could have been is only a possibility. And secondly, it doesn't do any good. It changes nothing except put you in a bad mood. Regretting what should have been is for real, it's for sure, and it, it is a significant improvement in and of itself. The person who regrets his sins an hour before he passes away, does it count? Yeah, all his sins are erased. But he didn't get a chance to make up for it. He didn't do any good because he passed away within an hour. The regret itself changed him into a different person. And he comes to heaven innocent. Makes a huge difference. So regretting what should have been is a moral victory. Regretting what could have been is just beating yourself up for nothing. So if we regret how we raised our children, If you're regretting what could have been, you could have sent him to a better college and he would now have a better job and be able to better raise his, raise his family. You don't know that. There's no guarantee, no matter which college you go to. And secondly, regretting it 
doesn't make any difference to anybody. Your son does not become more successful because you wish you had sent him to an Ivy League college. Not even, not even mentioning the fact that the Ivy League colleges are so immoral, as we've now discovered. On the other hand, you could be regretting what you should have done. Raise your child with more morality, with more Torah, with more goodness. That should have been. That's always correct. Yes, it should have been. It should have been. That kind of regret actually makes you a better person and in some way brings you closer to the child over whom you are regretting some of your decisions and some of your things in the way that you raise them. I guess you could say, if you regret what could have been, could have been, you're dehumanizing yourself. You're weakening the human in you. But if you regret what should have been, you're becoming more humane. You're becoming more of a mensch just by the regret itself. It humanizes, not dehumanizes. So they're very, really very different. As a result, if you are regretting what could have been you don't need to do that. It's not good, not healthy, not helpful, not may not even be true. If you're regretting what should have been, that's wonderful. That's the best regret in life. It's a regret that is constructive, humanizing, and makes a mensch out of you. In other words, don't regret the regret. If you stop with the regrets, then you can start to enjoy the empty nest because you did what you had to do. What you didn't do, you regret, which really makes a big difference and makes up for it. And now on to the next stage of life. This next stage of life is, in addition to spending time with your grandchildren, the next stage of life is you have more time to spend with God. And that's something we should do. Not only can, but should. So find ways of improving your relationship with God because that's what you are rich in. That's what you have enough to share time. Having a lot of time is not a curse, certainly not a punishment. It's a wealth. And when you're wealthy, you should donate some of it to God. More than 10% is great. 20% is good. Most people, unfortunately, when they think of empty nesting, they think of only of travel, like getting into an RV and driving cross country. But how much of that can you do? So some people spend the rest of their lives just running around, flying from place to place, they got to see this, they got to see that, visit all seven wonders of the, of, the, of the world. You may enjoy it, but I don't think that's why God gave you all this free time. And are you really enjoying or are you just filling time? 
So it's a great opportunity. The Rebbe once said, large families are very, very good because when you're empty nesting, you got so much free time that the best thing you can do is go visit your child or your grandchildren. But how long can you stay at your child's house before they get uncomfortable and you outstay your welcome? Two weeks? If you have two children, then you have four weeks of the of the year covered. If you have 10 children, you have 20 weeks of the year covered. So you see, it's a good investment in your future. But even that, if you had even 10 children, that's only 20 weeks. What do you do the rest of your time? It's not, it's not an unfortunate development that children grow up and leave the home and then you're alone. It's not a decline in your life. It's a new, it's a new challenge, new opportunity with new gifts. And the gift is free time. So the Torah actually says, if you want to get technical about it, at least for men, we are obligated, we have a mitzvah to study Torah. What does that mitzvah entail? Any minute that you are not busy with the essential needs of life, you should be studying Torah. In other words, you never have a free moment. It's never free. If you're not busy with what you must do, then you must be learning. So when do you get to have free time? Never. If you're not doing what people need, then you got to be doing what God needs. There's never a time when there's nothing you should be doing. And that's... At this stage in life, that's comforting. I am not at loose ends. I am I am not a useless human being. It's not like the old Eskimos used to put old people out to die because they're not useful anymore. There's no such thing. If God gives you an hour of time, you're useful to him. If he gives you a year, you're very useful. If he gives you 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you know, you retire at 60, the kids are out of the house, you're going to live to 90. That's a lot of time to accomplish a lot of good. It's not downtime. It's just a little different. So again, the thing that discourages us mostly is the regrets once the kids are out and we're thinking, what should I do? What should I have done? How should I have handled it? What, what kind of relationship I should have had with my children? It's either not a valid regret or it's a very productive regret. If it's not valid, then don't go there. If it's productive, then it's great. Somebody once said, raising children can be hard, can be exhausting, can be painful, with many disappointments and stuff. But it definitely makes a mensch out of you. Whether you succeeded or failed, either way, 
it will make a mensch out of you. If you succeeded, you feel like a mensch. If you failed, then the regret will make a mensch out of you. So you really can't lose. So take advantage. Thank God for all the free time and use it wisely. He's giving it to you for a reason. And it's certainly not true that nobody needs you anymore. You know, there was a guy back in the 60s. He wrote a book called Iron John. Everybody familiar with this? I don't remember his name. But he did, he started a little movement called the men's movement in response to the feminist women's movement. He started a men's movement. He came up with some interesting observations and discoveries. He was an alcoholic, suffered from it. So was his father. But he had no relationship with his father. Not surprisingly. When as an adult, he would go back to visit his parents, he would sit in the kitchen with his mother and his father would be in the living room watching television. And both he and his mother felt like the father is tuning them out, doesn't want to have a relationship with them, is ignoring them, and they were a little resentful. But one day it occurred to him, it's not his father who's avoiding them. They're avoiding him. He realized, I'm uncomfortable in my father's company, so I don't go in there because I don't want to talk to him. And he decided to change it. The next day or the next time that he went to visit home, he sat down in the living room next to his father and watched television with him. And it felt awkward, but he did it. The second time, the third time, it became a little more comfortable, a little more familiar. Eventually, they started to talk. And before his father passed away, he had developed a reasonably satisfying relationship with his father. And he writes in the book, that part of the tragedy of our time is that men don't have relationships with their fathers or with a mentor. And if a man has never gotten the approval of an older man, then he lives with a hole in his heart. To feel like you are a man among men, you need an older man to approve of you. So when he would give his lectures, and, and they were very popular, he would have auditoriums full of people. And he decided that he is going to try to implement his new discovery. So before he begins speaking to a room full of, let's say, 3,000 people, he says, anybody here over 65, please raise your hand. And of course, there would be some men there. And he would say, could you please honor us by sitting in the front? He says the atmosphere in the room changed so dramatically. There was a different feeling. There was a different awareness. 
And the tragedy is that since the 60s, anyone over 30 gets no respect. So who is a young man supposed to turn to for this approval if we have absolutely no respect for anyone over, th under, over 30? So in desperation, he says, young men get together in gangs to tell each other how great they are. And that doesn't work. Or men run around gathering approval from women. And that doesn't work. The only way a man feels like a man is if someone he considers an actualized man approves of him. Now, this can be a sergeant in the army, can be a professor at school, can be a rabbi, a minister, someone who is fully mature, who gives you the nod and says, you'll do, you're okay. That's it. You're in. So when he would invite, invite the 65-year-olds to sit in the front, without, without even consulting them or asking them for their wisdom, people felt more sane already. Because a society where anybody over 30 doesn't count is spiting themselves. We need people who have arrived in whatever way because their approval really can make a difference in a young person's life. And it's not only men. It's really everybody. I know for myself, I was not a good student. I didn't do well in school. So I never got any approval from any of my teachers. Until, I don't know, I was 17. And there was this one dean of the yeshiva who I really, really admired. And he took an interest. And that's all I needed. That was my invitation into healthy adulthood for men. And I was only there for one year. And the amount of time that he spent with me was all together, added all together, maybe two weeks. But it was a word here and a word there. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's not a long process. But without that, men will never know that they have become men. There'll always be doubt in their minds, uncertainty, insecurity. And they get married and they're desperate to get that approval from their wife. And they get it and it doesn't work. So they're angry at their wife because it didn't work. The older man who can make a younger man's life uh, he describes in his book as a male nurturer, a male mother. Men can't give birth and get pregnant, but they can give a younger man a life worth living by their blessing, by their approval, by their acceptance. So that's called a male nurturer. See, as long as a man needs approval, he can't nurture others. When a man doesn't need approval anymore, 
he's made it. He is now older. And either he's gotten approval or he doesn't really need it anymore. He doesn't care. Then his approval can be very effective. But if he still needs approval, he's not a nurturer. Women are nurturers because they're not as needy as men. In terms of identity. Women's identity was always much more secure than a man's identity. A man always has to prove himself a man in some way. Either physically, intellectually, emotionally. So, empty nest, it really is golden years. It really is. You have a lot to look back on with pride, satisfaction. You did your thing. You did it the best of your ability. No regrets. And the regrets of what should have been, yeah, that makes you a better person too. And now... You can face God with a clear conscience and improve your relationship with him. Because you've got the time. You also have the time to become a blessing to others, to younger people. Young people need older people. This crazy notion that older people are useless It's not just the older people who suffer from that. The younger people, without their mentors, suffer even more. So we really need to bring that back. Everyone must find a mentor. Not someone who will train you and teach you. and Someone who will approve of you. Show an interest, take you under their wing. Even if it's just for two weeks. Now you can be that person. If you're over 65 and you have an empty nest, you can be that person. To give your approval and your blessing and your nod to some younger person who needs it. May not even know he needs it, but he needs it. So that's the story with the empty nest. Empty is an opportunity to fill. Who was it who guy who said, he heard these people arguing whether the cup is half full or half empty. He walks in and he says, you can stop arguing now. I just filled the cup. <laughs> Why are you arguing whether it's half empty, half full? Fill it. You can do that once you're an empty nest. You fill somebody's cup and the debate is over. The possibility that your cup is half empty? No, it's not. You just filled it. So give your blessings to others and use your time to bring blessings to the world by bringing God into your life, bringing God into the world. That's really what we were created to do. We do it through our children for a while, and then we do it directly with God himself. There is no such thing as downtime. Time is only for up. It's never for down.
Anybody have any comments before we go? Type it in. By the way, going back to what we started with, we drove from LA to Miami. We took our time. It was a three week trip. Uh, we loaded up the freezer in the in the RV. We loaded it up with kosher products in LA because we had no idea what would be available between LA and, and Miami. All the stuff we loaded up on, we never got to use because all along the way, there was plenty of kosher products available. It was a big surprise. Now there's probably even more. Because this was so oh, about 10 years ago. Maybe more. So if you're going to take the RV, enjoy every minute of it. And if not, you're rich with time. Make your donations properly. Give some time to God, some time to your children and grandchildren, and some time to your neighbors. But take the time as a blessing, a wealth and invest it wisely. Thank you so much for listening. I just convinced myself into another RV. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rabbi Friedman. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to the uh, new programs coming out from It's Good to Know with Rabbi Friedman, some more learning opportunities. So be sure to check those out on our website and in your inbox if you're signed up for the uh, for the, our mailing list. And uh, we hope to see you on our next program. Have a wonderful night and looking forward to uh, hearing a lot of good.